Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Bible in a Year reading challenge, our Instagram live for day 130, May 10th. We are all the way through May 10th on day 130, and this is four consecutive days spending time in the Word, doing the Bible reading, and going live four consecutive days. That's right. I am asking God to help me to be faithful in doing the Bible in a Year Instagram Live every single day. This is the fourth day in a row. I'm so happy that all of you are here. Please do help me uh, bring everybody on the live by all of you inviting five to ten people. If you'll hit the share the live button in the bottom of your screen, I'm going to invite like 20 people. I'm going to send 20 people the video. Ever since I've been doing this, I've had about 10 or 15 people unfollow me, but that's okay because what I'm wanting um, following me on my Instagram are people that are interested in reading the Bible in a year, right? And uh, so, therefore, why not invite as many people as I possibly can to join us for the Bible in a Year reading challenge, right? So I have invited a whole bunch of people. Please join me in inviting some friends. Let's see how many people will join us tonight for the Bible in a Year reading challenge. And tonight, my friends, is a very, very important night on the Bible in a Year reading challenge. This is day 130. We are transitioning into a very important passage uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1 through 9, 27, John 6, 22 through 42, Psalm 106, 32 to 48, and Proverbs 14, 34 and 35 is our reading today. And friends, today we are going to be covering 1 Samuel chapter 8. It is a major transition in the biblical narrative from the time of the judges to the time of the kings. And there is very important uh, contemporary uh, contextualizations of this text that we can actually read this text and we can see how it relates to um, our lives in our current world. Um, and so I'm, I'm really looking forward to doing the Bible in a year right now with you. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1 through 9, 27, John 6, 22 to 42, Psalm 106, 32 to 48, and Proverbs 14, 34 and 35 were our readings for today for the Bible in a Year reading challenge day 130, 130 days into the year, and we are still on course to read the Bible in a Year, to have an Instagram live done for each and every single day of the year. It's very exciting. And by the way, friends, I just want to remind you, it is never too late. It is never too late to start the Bible in a Year reading challenge. You can go to my Instagram right now. You can click the link tree link in my bio and you can download the Bible in a Year reading plan that I have right in front of me, which is done by the month. And I want to encourage you, if you download the Bible in a Year reading plan and you start doing the Bible in a Year, don't try to start from the beginning, January 1. Start right from where we're at today. It's never too late to start. And the best way to do the Bible in a Year reading challenge is to do one reading every day. Pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life. Ask God to help you to understand God's word. And Uh, I can promise you, if you if you join us in this Bible in a Year reading challenge, you're going to be totally blessed. Naomi says, your voice sounds like it's healing, and you have that absolutely correct. My voice is healing, and I'm very excited about that. Praise the Lord, we have 12 people on the live now. I'm getting ready to pray and to start our live Friends, remember, um, you can go to my Instagram and you can click the link tree link in my bio, um, bio. You can download the Bible in a Year reading challenge plan so that you can join us for the Bible in a Year reading challenge. And I do want to remind you, we do have, let me turn my camera around here so you can see. So as part of the reading plan, can you guys believe all that we've read? We've done January. Look at this. 
We've done all of the readings for January, February, March, April, and we are 10 days into May. But the thing I want to remind you of is our one-year Bible reading challenge that you can download by going to my Instagram, going to the link tree. Uh, this Bible in a Year reading plan actually has instructions for how the Bible in a Year reading plan works. And um, here's the questions that you can be asking, okay? Um, number one, did you discover anything in today's reading that you never noticed before? Okay, so as you're reading through the Bible in a year, you want to be asking, what is it that I'm learning today on today's reading that I have never seen before in Scripture? Question number two, did you learn something today that caused you to grow in your, your relationship with God? If so, how? Question number three, what Bible promise would you want to claim through this reading? Question number four, what did you learn that you can apply to your life today? Right? And the reason why I encourage people to ask these questions as they're going through the Bible in your reading challenge, as you're taking time to pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit every single day in your life, as you're taking time to go through the Bible and read it, the reason why I encourage people to ask these questions and to journal is because, friends, we're not really doing ourselves any good if we just take the time to read through the Bible, speed read through it, and we don't do any reflective listening and thinking and journaling in God's Word. When we spend time journaling and when we spend time praying and we, we spend time asking questions and praying for the Holy Spirit, God is going to speak to us. Okay, and he's going to impress things upon our hearts and our minds, and we're going to journal them. And then when you're going through hard seasons of your life, you can open your Bible in a year reading journal, and you can look back at how God has grown you over the year. You can look back at the Bible promises that you've been claiming. You can look back at the prayers you've been praying. You can look back at the things that you learned as you went through the Bible, and you can also look back at the ways that you have grown in your understanding of God and his love for you. So, friends, it is so important. It is so important uh, to understand that the reason why I do the Bible in a Year reading challenge the way I do, we have an Old Testament, New Testament, Psalm, and Proverbs reading. It, it helps you to read the Bible devotionally. It helps you to read the Old Testament and the New Testament and to see that the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament is the same God. It also helps you to see a um, kind of a, a co, um, what do you, coherency. The scriptures um, are cogent. You know, they, as you go through the Bible, the Bible agrees with the Bible, right? So you, you start to see that the, the story of the Bible and the themes of the Bible um, agree with each other throughout. The Bible doesn't need any help um, confirming that what it says is true. Uh, let me see. I don't know why, but I have been looking up the meaning to the names of the people in the chapters, and it's amazing how the meanings go along with the theme of the story. Yes, that is one of the things that's amazing about people when they named their children. Sherry, that is a great thing to do. I'm excited that you're doing that. You're learning. Uh, you're starting to see how the Bible is an inspired text. The Holy Spirit has moved through uh, the patriarchs and the prophets and the holy men of old, and there is not one word that proceeds from the mouth of God. There is not one word in Scripture that is not profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for um, instruction in righteousness. And so the word of God will never return to him void. It's so exciting to be a part of it. It's so exciting to be reading it together. And remember, friends, if you fall behind on the Bible in a Year reading challenge, we are posting all of the Instagram lives on YouTube. And I hear from people all over the place who are like, hey, listen, we are not all the way caught up on day 130, but we're working through it as a family. We're watching the YouTube videos together. You can find the Pendleton Adventist Church YouTube by just going to my Instagram, clicking the link tree link. There's a link there for the Bible reading plan. There's a link there for the YouTube. It's all there. So uh, feel free to head over there to check it out, um, to get started on your Bible in a Year reading plan. It's never too late to start the Bible in a Year reading challenge. 
And I just want to thank all of you who are inviting people to be a part of the Bible in a Year Reading Challenge. If you're listening to the sound of my voice right now, click that little send button in the bottom right-hand corner of your Instagram uh, live video and invite five people to join us. Tell five people you know about the Bible in a Year Reading Challenge. Invite them to join us. We will be excited to have them, and they can just start tomorrow, May 11, by doing the Bible reading tomorrow and joining us on the Instagram Live and becoming a part of our Bible in a Year reading community. Okay, let's go ahead and pray, and let's jump into our text for the day. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for each and every single person that's listening to the sound of my voice right now and for all of the people that are a part of the Bible in a Year reading challenge around the world who watch on YouTube and on Facebook and on Instagram. Lord, please be with me now. Pour out your Holy Spirit in this moment and use me to speak your words of life uh, during this Bible in a Year reading challenge. Lord, I just pray that every person who needs to hear what is going to be said today will be impressed to come on the live and join us and stay with us and to listen to the things that you will speak through me about your word today. I just want to thank you for doing this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, here we go. It's exciting. Thank you, all of you who have joined me. There's 11 of you that are with me right now. I'm excited that all of you are here. And um, I'm still looking for still some others that are normally with us that are not with us tonight. I'm surprised. Okay, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1 through 927. 1 Samuel 8, verse 1 through 927. Here we go. Um, the header here is Israel demands a king. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside again after after gain, they turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all of the other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Friends, you see, when we choose to serve the Lord, and when we speak, When when we um sorry I, I I lost my train of thought for just a second but now it's back it, he said obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you for they have not rejected you but they have rejected me from being king over them friends when we're following the Lord when we're proclaiming the word of the Lord if people reject us if you're doing what God has called you to do and you're suffering rejection you got to remember something they did it to the Lord. They are doing it to you, but you shouldn't take it personal. They're not rejecting you. They are, in fact, rejecting the Lord. They are rejecting Jesus from being king over them. When the people asked for Samuel to give them a king, when they said, give us a king to judge us, it was not a rejection of Samuel. It was not a rejection of the order that God had placed but in fact, it was it was not a rejection of Samuel. It was an, it was a rejection of the Lord as the king. And here's what the Lord says. This is what he says about the people. Listen to this. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. So here's the crazy thing. Um, the Lord tells Samuel, Go ahead and give them a king, but warn them 
that if they have a king, this is what the king is going to do to them. And listen to what the Lord says through Samuel. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and your female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. In that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Friends, I just got something to say to you right now. Over and over and over again, we have chosen to set up governments which mirror the governments of the heathen nations around us. We choose to put kings over us. We choose to put presidents over us. We choose to put governors. We choose to put men over us. And we believe more in the politics and the money and the kingdoms of this world than we do in the kingdom of God. We don't want Jesus to be our king. And so we choose a king like this. And it's amazing because the people come to Samuel and they say, you know what? We don't want a prophet over Israel anymore. We want a king. We want to be like the other nations. We want to have a leadership structure which which mirrors we want a leadership structure which mirrors the leadership structure of the heathen nations around us. And the Lord says, hey, listen, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. Don't take it personal. Don't feel bad about this. The children of Israel rejected the Lord all through the wilderness. And he says, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They are rejecting me. They do not want me as king. They do not want to follow the advice that I'm giving them. They would prefer to have for themselves a king who will take their sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. Do you realize what that's saying? It's saying, you know what? If you elect for yourselves a king, if you do things in the way that the surrounding nations do things, your sons are going to be sent by this king to war to die on his behalf and for his agenda. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters away from you. He's going to take your best daughters. How many wives did Saul have? How many concubines and wives did Solomon have? How many wives did David have? You see, the Lord was trying to warn them. If you do things like the heathen nations, you're going to have a leader who is going to exercise his power over you. He will send your sons to war. He will take your best daughters, your most beautiful women for wives. He will have, he will take your male servants and your female servants. He will make himself and his household wealthy. He will use his position of power to make himself wealthy. And you will all be poor. What are we, what's happening in our world today? Friends, even the people who call themselves Christians and sit in the church put more faith in money and the leaders of this world and science than they do the word of God. And as a result, we have become slaves to a system where the rich are getting richer the poor are getting poor. There are more and more homelessness in the streets. And friends, I'm not talking politics here. I'm saying we have chosen the politics and the leaders in this world. We, re we reverence them more than we do the Lord. We have chosen to reject the Lord and to make people our king rather than the Lord. And you know what? I can even, I can even give you a real practical a contemporary application for this as well today. People go to church 
And instead of being a priesthood of all believers, instead of choosing to be disciples for the Lord, you know what people do? They go to church and they put their pastors or people in ministry on pedestals. That's right. You make people your leader rather than making Jesus your king. And because we end up fixating on human leaders and we make pastors and people in ministry idols. When those people sin and let us down, we turn our back on God and walk away from God because of bad leadership. Did you guys hear what I just said? Because we are disappointed in people, we end up turning our back on God because we haven't in fact been asking Jesus to be our king. We haven't in fact been in a relationship with Jesus, we haven't decided to be disciples to follow Jesus, and instead we end up fixating on human leaders. And when those human leaders sin and let us down, we become disillusioned and we end up not believing in God because of it. And so the Lord warns Israel through Samuel. And he says, listen, you guys say that you want a king. You guys say that you want to be just like all of the other nations. But if I appoint a king over you, that's not my best plan for you. It's not going to go well. The king is going to make him and his friends and his household very wealthy. And the people of the land will suffer because the king is going to have the best and the people are going to be left with what's left over. But the people of Israel refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us. So they said, yeah, 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 yeah. Listen, Samuel, we hear what you're saying, but you know what? We want a king. And so they end up appointing a king over themselves. And we know how it goes, don't we? But it's very interesting, friends, because you actually look at 1 Samuel chapter 9. What do we find out? God honors their decision. Isn't that right? Because when we look at what it says here at the end of um, 1 Samuel chapter 8, what does it say? The people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but there shall be a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city, right? And I was trying to find where it was said, but essentially the Lord told Samuel, he says, Listen, these people have rebelling these people have been rebelling against me since I brought them out of slavery. Right? Lynn Rydell says he always warns us but then he lets us go and make our own mistakes. That's absolutely right. He gives us warnings. But then he lets us go make our own mistakes. And here's the funny thing. Friends, here's one of the things I've realized. The Lord asks us to repent of sin, to be baptized, and to become disciples, and to make disciples, okay? That means the members of God's church are supposed to all be in ministry. Members are ministers. But what do the church members do? Appoint for us a pastor, right? Let him go out and fight the battle for us. Let him put on the armor of the Lord and go out and fight the warfare, right? Because the war that we're fighting is not against flesh and blood enemies, but against powers and principalities of evil in unseen heavenly realms. But here's the sad part. Usually the church members think, we need to get us a pastor so he can solve all of our problems and go take care of the people that we don't like. We need to get us a pastor so that the pastor can do the ministry. We need to get us a pastor so the pastor can have a relationship with Jesus and preach the sermons. We'll just come to church on Saturday, right? And we'll let the pastor the person that we've made into a king, a priest over us, we'll let him have a relationship with Jesus 
and we'll come to church between 11 a.m. and 12.15, and we'll let the pastor break the bread for us, but we're not going to spend time in the Word of God. Let the pastor go out and fight the battles. Let the pastor be a disciple. Let the pastor be an elder. And here's the sad part. People end up living their worldly lives six days a week. They come to church for less than two hours because most people don't even come to Sabbath school anymore. You heard me. I'm talking to all of you Christian people out there. Most of you call yourselves Christians. You live worldly lifestyles. You put more faith in in the leaders of this world, in the politics of this world, in the money and the kingdoms of this world. You spend most of your time chasing after the wind after worldly possessions. And then you come to church. You don't come for Sabbath school. You come between 11 o'clock when the service starts and 12.15. That's it. And if the pastor isn't reading his Bible, if the pastor's relationship with God isn't good, you're left at the mercy of the man leading you in front because you're not even opening your own Bible to find out if what the pastor's preaching is true. And this is exactly what Israel was doing, appointing themselves a king. We want the king to go fight our battles. We want the king to solve our problems. We want to put our faith, we want to put our faith in one man to rule over us and judge us and make the decisions for everybody. And God says, hey, that's not a good idea. You're putting yourselves at the mercy of one very fallible man. He's going to take your sons and send them to war. He's going to take your daughter as wives. <laughs> Bartley says, pastors are the preacher, the treasurer, the fundraiser, and the outreach. And we have to do the weddings, the baby dedications, the baptisms, the funerals. Right? Marco, let's get it. Bartley says, where is the church? Marco says, God will fight our battles. You got it, baby. If we would let the Lord be our king, then then you know what would end up happening? Do you know what would end up happening? If every single church member would take it seriously that we are to be disciples of Christ that are making disciples, we would end up preaching the gospel of the kingdom into all the world as a witness to all the nations and the work would be done. And what pastors are really supposed to be doing is equipping the members of the church. We're supposed to be training and teaching the members and praying with the members and encouraging the members to read the Bible. We are supposed to be we are supposed to be equipping the members to have their own relationship with Jesus so that they can end up making it into the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Now, when you read 1 Samuel chapter 9. You see the story of Saul. Listen to this. Now the day before Saul, this is going to be 1 Samuel 9.15. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow about this time, I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, For I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. Okay, here's the amazing thing about this. You guys ready for this? God blessed what the people chose, even though it wasn't his best plan for them. I'm going to say that again. God chose to give them a king. God blessed what the people chose, even though it wasn't his best plan. He chose to bless what they had chosen. However, the consequences of not choosing God's best plan, God could not save them from. Did you hear me? God chose to bless them and give them a king. However, God could not save them from the consequences of not choosing God's best plan. How many of us are living our lives Choosing to do what's right in our own eyes rather than choosing to follow the word of God and to ask God to show us his plan for our life. Friends, 
Why is it that we don't trust God? Why isn't it that we we always want to ask God to bless what we want to do rather than going to God and asking him to reveal to us his plan? He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek me first, he says, and I will add everything unto you. My word is a lamp unto your feet. My word is a light unto your path and a lamp unto your feet. My word can show you. God wants to give us better than what we're settling for. And, and I have, I, I'm going to have hundreds of people who are going to listen to this live. That are settling for second best. We're settling. And God will bless what we choose because he loves us and he's given us the freedom to choose. He's given us free will. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus chose to love us knowing, listen to this, Jesus chose to love you unconditionally. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. He chose to love you unconditionally knowing that you might not ever choose to love him back. And he chooses over and over and over and over and over and over and over to bless his children. Israel had rebelled. Ever since they left Egypt, they were rebelling against the Lord. They were refusing to listen to the Lord. They were refusing to follow the word of the Lord. They were refusing to listen to the word that the Lord was giving through Moses. They were rejecting the Lord all the way. And they say, you know what? We don't want prophets anymore. We don't want seers over us. We want a king. We want to be like the other nations. And so God blesses what the people ask for. Even though it was not God's best plan. Even though it was not God's best plan, God ended up giving the people what they wanted. And here's what I want to say to you guys tonight, friends. God does have a plan for you. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, declares the Lord. Not thoughts or plans for evil, but plans to give you hope in the future. If we would only believe that God created us and made us to have life and life more abundant. If we would only go to God asking him for his best plan for our life. He would show it to us. He would reveal to us the plan that he has for our life, if we would come to him, trusting him, that he's really going to give us his best. But instead, we come to God with our own plan. <laughs> yeah, God, I know your word says, but this is what I want. <laughs> God, I know you wanted to send us Samuel the prophet, and that you wanted to send us prophets after that to rule over Israel, but we want a king. We want a king like other nations. And then Samuel warns them, listen, if you get a king, he's going to take your sons and send them to war. If you get a king, he's going to take your best land. If you get a king, he's going to take your male servants and your female servants. And he's going to have everybody working to make him rich. If you get a king, he's going to take your daughters. He's going to have 700 concubines and 300 wives. If you get a king, he's a flawed sinner. And he's going to rule over you. And you're not going to be happy once you have the plan that you want. The people say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what, God? Listen, we heard what you said. But we want you to do our plan. Because we don't trust your plan. And so, friend, friends, the world is full of Christians who come to Jesus with the plan that they have for their life. Rather than coming to Jesus and trusting that Jesus has a plan for their life. And if we would trust Jesus... If we would ask him to show us his best for us, if we would spend time in his word daily, if we would be a part of the Bible in a year reading challenge, praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and saying, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. Lord, I want to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Lord, I want you to show me your plan for my life. Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I want you to be the king. I want you to be the one that rules over my life because I trust that Jesus, if you're the king of my life, your plan for my life is better than my plan for my life. Is anyone picking up what I'm putting down tonight? Is anyone hearing what I'm saying tonight?
But here's another beautiful lesson. Are you guys ready for another lesson? Give me a thumbs up. So first of, first of all, tonight we've learned when we see that God decides to give Israel a king, right? God blesses what the people ask for, even though it wasn't God's best plan. Okay? God is good. God, God is willing. God is good. God is willing to bless what we choose, even when it's not his best plan. Here's another lesson. Are you guys ready? I got the thumbs up coming. Lisa, I got Carrie, I got Marco, I got Lynn, I got Tammy, I got Naomi, I got Lisa, I got Marco, I got Leah. We got 14 people on the live now. The live keeps growing tonight. And if, if you just joined us, friends, take a moment. Hit the send button in the bottom corner, the right-hand corner, and invite five or ten people to join us on the Bible in a Year Reading Challenge. You never know who needs to listen to this video. You never know who's going to end up deciding to go to the link tree link in my bio on my Instagram and download the Bible in a Year reading plan. You never know who's going to decide, you know what, today's the day. It's never too late to start the Bible in a Year reading challenge. Today's my day. I'm going to start praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in my life. I'm going to start reading the Bible every day. I'm going to start trusting God that his plan for my life is better than mine. I am tired of doing it my way. I'm tired of those 911 prayers. I'm tired of being a, a, seven, a seventh day Adventist and I want to be a Christian seven days a week. Because the sad thing is, is that whether you keep Saturday or Sunday, most Christians are riding the coattails of their pastor's relationship with Jesus rather than having their own relationship with Jesus. Six days a week, we're out there in the rat race trying to go after everything the world has to offer. And we think that we're going to end up being ready to go to heaven. We think that we're going to be ready to go to heaven by sitting in church one hour a week and paying tithe. But friends, I've got news for you. If you love the leaders of this world and the politics of this world and the money of this world and the things of this world more than you love God, what's going to happen? You're going to end up being a house divided. Because friends, you can't love and serve both God and the kingdoms of this world. You can't love and serve both God and money. You can't love and serve God when you love the things of this world and your plan for your life more than you love God's plan for your life. But let's look at what it says here. 1 Samuel 9, um, verse 18. Let's start with that. Uh, Naomi says, you'll be destroyed with them. And also, you'll run out of oil, uh, Carrie says. Yeah, that's right. We're going to need oil in our lamp, aren't we? If you choose this world, then God will let you have this world. But it's not leading um, It's not leading to eternal life if you're living like that. Okay, you guys ready? Let's go to 1 Samuel 9, verse 18. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me where is the house of the seer? Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you? And for all your father's house, Saul answered, Am I not a Benjamite? Am I not a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? Friends, 
I got good news for you. If you are feeling like you are last in line, if you are feeling like you are one of the least of these, if you are feeling like in your life right now you are all the way down at the bottom of the heap, when Israel asked for a king, the Lord sent the prophet Samuel, the seer, and he had he picked the king from the Benjaminite, the least of the tribes of Israel, and from the clan that was the humblest of the tribe of Benjamin. And so Saul says, hey, listen, man, I come from Benjamin. Our tribe is considered the least. And my clan is the poorest and most humble of all of the clans within with, within Benjamin. Why in the world would you say to me, that all of Israel, that all of Israel is for my father's household. Here's why he said it. It's because Israel had asked for a king and God had chosen a man from the tribe considered the least and the clan that was the poorest and the most humble. Because God likes to take people who are last. And make them first. Are you feeling like you're in last place? Are you feeling like God has forgotten you? Are you feeling tired and discouraged? Are you struggling? Are you a single person that's been praying for a relationship and it seems like God has a partner for everyone but you? Do you feel like you're last in line? Are you feeling impatient? Are you feeling like when you were born into this world that you came into the family that nobody would have wanted? Or that you were born into a family that nobody wants? I know for me, my parents divorced when I was 12. My dad got kicked out of the church. My family was the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the church politics, okay? And with a, with a last name far, I was never supposed to be hired as a pastor in the church. You know why? Because a lot of people didn't want me because I am my father's son. Plain and simple. Not because of who I am, but because I came from... The most humble, poor family with a father who divorced my mother and was kicked out of the church. Right? And all through the 13 years that I was doing ministry since 2005 until I was hired in 2016. So I think that's, let me see, 7, 8, 9, 10... That's four plus six, six, seven, eight. So all through those years, doing volunteer ministry and washing dishes in dish pits, working in restaurants, serving tables, and volunteer leading churches full time, and working two jobs while going through a rise and through college and everything else, everybody told me, you'll never make it. Aren't you Mike Farr's son? Aren't you the one that was homeless and was an alcoholic and... Right? You're not going to ever get hired. You're not married. You'll never get hired as a pastor. And guess what? God chose me. Because I was the person that everyone esteemed as the least... And the unworthy, the broken, the discarded, the hopeless, the worthless, the nobody. And guess what? God chose me. 
Are you feeling like you're in last place? Are you feeling like you're from the most humble clan in the lowest tribe? Are you feeling tonight like maybe God forgot you? I got news for you. God chooses those who feel like they're last. And he makes them first. So that he can get the honor and the glory that comes from taking the people that are low down. And putting them at his banqueting table in the seats of honor. Genesis 50 verse 20 says, Whatever the devil has done to you, whatever the enemy has done for you, to you, God has allowed these circumstances in order to bring about circumstances that will make it possible for you to be used to bring salvation to many friends. Do not be discouraged. Do not be discouraged. God has a seat for you at his banqueting table. God has not forgotten you. Put your faith in him. Trust his plan. Do not do things. Do not settle for your own plan for your life. Do not allow the enemy to convince you to give up. God has a plan for you. I love it. We got 15 people on the live right now and we started with four. So guess what? God is blessing. Okay, let's move on to our New Testament reading today. We read from, for Bible in the Year, day 130 is the one that we're on. We are on John chapter 6, 22 to 34. Oh man, you just got to love this. I almost just have to read. Did you guys read this today? John 6, 22 to 42. It is beautiful. Let me just start here in verse 26. Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Friends, Jesus is the bread. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And God the Father has set his seal on Jesus the Son. Let's keep reading. This is the work of God that you believe in him who has sent me. So guess what? If you want to do the work of God... Be in his word. Why? Because the work that leads to eternal life is being in the word, not the word that... He's literally saying, friends, quit making your top priority earning the money and earning your food and earning your way in this world and instead start valuing the word which leads to eternal life. I've set my seal on Jesus. Read the word that will lead you to faith in Jesus. If you'll spend time breaking the bread... Praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Don't rely on your pastor to do it for you. Okay? If you will spend time in God's word praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you will be it, you will be illumined by God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to understand the word of God, to break the bread of the word of God. You will have the food which leads to life eternal. And, and he says, listen, if you'll seek my kingdom first, I'm going to add all of the things that you need. The birds don't worry about where they're going to get their food. The flowers don't worry about where they're going to get their clothes. Don't worry about that stuff. Put me first. Put me first. I'm going to take care of you. But if you want to do the work of my Father in heaven, this is the work of God. That you believe on him who he has sent. The work of God is believing in Jesus who God sent. The work of God is opening the word, praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and allowing God to help you to break the bread so that you can have the bread of God which leads to life eternal rather than spending all of your time seeking after the things of this world.
Here we go. Jesus then said to them, it's verse 32, John 6, 32. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. <laughs> Friends, are you picking up what I'm putting down? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among men. Are you hearing what he's saying? He's saying, listen, you guys are so focused on trying to earn the money. You're, you're so focused because I gave you bread that you can put in your mouth and eat. But you're not focused on doing the work of God, which is valuing the word of God that was given to you through Moses. And oh, by the way, Moses isn't the one that gave you the manna in the wilderness. I am. Jesus is saying, don't you know the Lord who gave you the manna in the wilderness that fed you and your children until you could come to the promised land you're living in now? He's the one who gave you the bread. And it was Jesus who did the miracle to feed the 5,000. He's saying, I am the true bread. I'm the one who gave you the bread, but you shouldn't keep seeking after the bread that you can put in your mouth but instead, you should realize that the bread of life is standing right in front of you. And if you will actually eat this bread, if you will break this bread, if you will listen to my words, if you will honor the one who my father in heaven sent, who is Jesus himself, he says, if you'll honor me, if, you'll, if, if man will live by the word of God, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If we would only value his word, if we would only seek his kingdom first, if we would only rem remember that the word of God is the light. It is the lamp unto our feet into the light unto our path. It will lead us into the life that we want to live. If we would just trust him. If we would just ask Jesus to be our king. If we wanted to be a part of the kingdom of heaven more than we want to have the riches of this world, if we would believe in Jesus more than we believe in the leaders of this world, if we would turn our eyes upon Jesus and put our faith in him, he can give us everything. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Friends, if you are calling yourself a Christian, and you are claiming that you know Jesus, if you know Jesus, you know the Father, and the only prayer that we should be praying is, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Jesus didn't come to do his own thing. Jesus came to do the will of his Father who sent him. And this is the will of him who sent me, Jesus says. Listen to this. John six thirty nine, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing for all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Do you understand that Jesus is saying, listen, I came to give life to all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't send Jesus to condemn us. Did you hear what I just said? Jesus was not sent to condemn and destroy you, but instead Jesus was sent to save you. And he said, "My the, the father in heaven, listen to this, and this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. Do you understand what I'm saying here? The will of God in heaven is, is that Jesus should be actually empowered to save us all. That's what God wants. God's plan is not for your destruction. Hell is going to be prepared for Satan and his angels, not people. God does not want to put the children that he has created and formed in their mother's womb in hell, God says, and this is the will of him who sent me. Jesus said, and this is the will of my father in heaven, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Do you understand what I'm saying? All who will put their faith in Jesus will have eternal life 
because that is the will of God the Father to save you. And that's why he sent Jesus. He didn't send Jesus to condemn you. He sent Jesus to save you. Jesus died so that I can live. Jesus died so that my heart can beat. Jesus died so that I can breathe air into my lungs. Jesus died so that I can be his hands and feet. Jesus died so that my mouth can proclaim the gospel of his kingdom. Jesus died so that I can receive the Holy Spirit, so that I can understand the word of God and break the bread which leads to life eternal. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for you. And it is the will of the Father in heaven to save you, not to condemn you. Why can't we understand that Jesus wants to be our king because he wants to give us life and life more abundantly and yet we continue to choose the things of this world while denying the only person who has ever died for us. For this is the will of my father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. And I will raise Him up on the last day. And you know how they respond to this beautiful sermon? Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does He now say, I have come from heaven? He feeds the 5,000. He shows them that God has blessed him and anointed him with power from on high to heal the sick, cast out demons, to feed the hungry. And they go, yeah, but you know what? Isn't your dad Joseph? Oh, you'll see how this ties in. Hey, hey, Stephen, isn't your dad Mike Farr? You're not called. You'll never be a pastor. You're nobody. You come from the family whose father has been blacklisted in our church and kicked out because we said that he's no good. I'm tired of seeing this stuff go on, friends. I'm sick and tired of seeing people that are pastors and leaders in the church treating people like they don't belong. What, because you say so? I happen to know that my Father in Heaven sent His only begotten Son because His Son came to die so that I can live. Don't tell me what I'm worth. Because the God that I serve takes the people that you think are the least and he promotes them to the seat of honor at his table. It doesn't matter what people say. It don't matter what church leaders say. It don't matter what the people say who say that you're a nobody. Because if you'll turn your eyes upon Jesus, if you'll look full in his wonderful face, I've got news for you. On the last day, he's going to call your name and if you honor Jesus before man, he's going to honor you before his father. He's going to give you his robe of righteousness. He's got a signet ring for you. He's going to sit you at the seat of honor at his banqueting table. Friends, it don't matter what people think. We got to start asking what God thinks. It don't matter what your plan for your life is. It don't matter what the devil told you your identity is. It matters what your identity is in the eyes of the Father who sent His Son to die for you so that He can give you eternal life. It don't matter what people say. It don't matter what the kingdoms of this world think. And it don't matter what the money and all of the things that are going on in this world say about what your future is. Because if you will put your faith in Jesus, then your future is that God is going to give unto you all that he has taught your heart to desire. I'll say it again. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things. All of those things that we thought the kings could give us. The kings of this world. Samuel, don't be upset that the people are rejecting you. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus because they don't want him as king. But instead they would prefer to have a kingdom run like the heathen nations around them that worship false gods. 
They're not rejecting you, friends. If you're really a disciple of Christ and you're following him and you've chosen to put Jesus first, if you're praying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If that's your prayer and they're rejecting you, they're not rejecting you. Don't take it personal. They killed the prophets that came before you. They killed Jesus. And remember, the war that we're fighting is not a battle against flesh and blood, but it's against powers and principalities of darkness in the unseen heavenly realms. Friends, don't listen to what the people say about you that say that you're not good enough. Instead, look to your Savior, Jesus Christ, who says, I'm giving my life so that I can share my kingdom with you. When Jesus had all power and authority, when the entire kingdom belonged to him, in that moment he gave his life so that he could give you an equal inheritance. Friends, Quit trusting in your plan for your life and start trusting in Jesus' plan for your life. Okay, here we go to the Psalms. Psalm 106, starting in verse 34. Listen to this. They did not destroy the peoples as the Lord commanded them, but they mixed with the nations who worshipped the false gods and they learned to do as they did. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. This is happening in our world today. Thus they became unclean by their acts and played the whore in their deeds. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people and he abhorred his heritage. He gave them into the hand of the nations so that those who hated them ruled over them. Their enemies oppressed them and they were brought into subjection under their power. Many times the Lord delivered them. But every time they were rebellious in their purposes and they were brought low through their own iniquity. Every time they cried out to the Lord, the Lord delivered them. And then they went right back to the sins which caused them to end up captive to the enemy in the first place. Friends, does this sound familiar? We cry out to the Lord in the times of trouble. God delivers us from the times of trouble and he puts us into times of plenty. And in those times of plenty, we forget the God who we cried out to and saved us. And we go right back to whoring ourselves to the things of this world. And we forget the God who, who loves us. But listen to this. Here's the hope. Nevertheless, he looked upon their distress when he heard their cry, for their sake he remembered his covenant and relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. Even though the people sinned, even though the people didn't choose God's best plan, he says, you know what? For the sake of the covenant I've made with you, I'm going to relent from the punishment that you're getting that you deserve, and I'm going to give you out of the accordance of the abundance of my steadfast love. He caused them to be pitied by all of the people who held them captive. He even made the people who held them captive give pity to them so that they would receive favor from the enemy that they caused themselves to be captive to. Save us, O Lord our God. Gather us from among the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. And here's the, here's the verse that Naomi chose for the day. Blessed be the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. And praise the Lord. I'm going to tell you something. I serve a God who always gives us better than we deserve. I serve a God who is always giving us better than we deserve. Even when we don't listen to him, even when we choose to do our own plan, 
and we go our own way, I serve a God who loves us enough that he gives us his steadfast love even in the face of our rebellion. He gives us his steadfast love when we deserve punishment. Let's listen to Proverbs 14, 34, and 35. Righteousness exalts a nation. Friends, if we would ask Jesus to be our righteousness, he is the author and the perfecter of our faith, Christ our righteousness. Righteousness, Jesus exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. A servant who deals wisely has the king's favor. But his wrath falls on one who acts shamefully. Friends, let's seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things will be added unto us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Bible in a Year, Day 130. Thank you for helping me make it onto the Instagram Live four days in a row now. I just want to pray that you will continue to give me the ability to make it onto the live every single day. And I want to praise you. I want to praise you, Lord. I want to praise you from the bottom of my heart that you have given us your word, which is the bread of life. You have given your life for us so that all who believe on you will not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, help us to put our faith in you. Help us to choose your best plan for our life rather than settling for the second best plan. We know that you love us and that you bless us even when we don't choose your best. But God, help us to make you our king. Jesus, we want you to be our king because when we know that when we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that the plan that you give us for our life is better than we could ever choose for ourselves. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us and for keeping us is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, God bless you. Have a wonderful night. This has been Bible in a Year Instagram Live for day 130 of our Bible in a Year reading challenge. I will be back tomorrow for day 131. I'm going to try to make it on at 5.15 Pacific Daylight Time tomorrow. Pray for me that I can make it on time. I hope all of you were blessed. If you were blessed, hit the share button on this live and share it with your friends. If you believe that this live is a blessing and you heard things that you think could bless people you know, hit the share button. Share this video with as many people as you can and invite them to be a part of the Bible in a Year Reading Challenge. Show them how to get on my um, Instagram and to find the link tree link so that they can join the Bible in a Year Reading Challenge. Uh, how many of you that are watching right now are willing to invite one friend? How many of you are willing to take between now and tomorrow to share the Bible in a Year reading plan with one friend? If all 13 of you share the Bible in a Year reading plan with one friend and you invite them to join us tomorrow at 515 Pacific Daylight Time, tomorrow we're going to have 28 people Tomorrow, we're going to have 22 people where we have 11 right now, okay? Go find a friend. Invite somebody to join us, friends. Because I believe that if we will continue to invite people to do the Bible in a Year Reading Challenge, by the end of the year, we only have 13 people listening right now on the live. By the end of the year, we're going to have 100 people listening. And it's not about the numbers, but here's what it is about. If 100 people commit to reading the Bible in a year, we're going to have 100 people set on fire that are going to go out and start telling others about Jesus. And then thousands are going to hear about Jesus. And then millions are going to hear about Jesus. And then all of the people all over the world are going to hear the gospel of the kingdom preached into all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then when we're done... 
Letting Jesus use us to preach the gospel of his kingdom into all the world as a witness to all the nations. Jesus is going to come again. We have 235 days left to tell others about Jesus, to tell others about the Bible in a year reading challenge. Lynn Rydell says, I've already told all of my friends, already have all of my friends doing Bible in a year, but I will find someone new. Thank you, Lynn. Lynn actually shared it with a friend of hers in Africa. 3,000 people, 3,000 people joined the Bible in a Year Reading Challenge in Africa in one day because of an evangelist that Lynn Rydell shared the Bible in a Year Reading Challenge with. 3,000 people sitting in an evangelistic meeting made the commitment to do the Bible in a Year Reading Challenge in Africa because of, because of that. So praise God for all of you. We've got 235 days left to tell other people about the Bible in a Year reading challenge. Friends, by the end of the year, we could have 500 people on the live every night. I got to get consistent about going live at 515. And I want all of you to share with everybody that you know. And you know what, friends? Download the Bible in a Year uh, reading challenge. You know what you could do? You could print off enough copies and take it to everyone at your church. You could share it with everyone at your church and you could invite everyone you know at your church to join the Bible in a Year reading challenge. We could share it with everybody we know. We could share it with the Bible in a Year. We could, we could take the Bible in a Year reading plan, email it. Make an email. Send an email. Send the plan to everybody you know and tell them to print it off and do it. You never know who's going to choose to do the Bible in a Year reading plan and to have their life set on fire for Jesus. And as a result, guess what? Someday you're going to meet people in heaven that you never met before. So we need to make an appointment with God at 515 every day. Yes. Okay, I'm going to try to be more consistent about going live right at 515. And I'm going to ask you guys to start inviting people to start printing off and handing out the Bible reading challenge plan, give it to people. Put it in their hand. Tell them about the Instagram, at Stephen Farr 12. Let's turn this into a movement that takes the word of God all over the world. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful night. I'll see you tomorrow is day 131, and I hope you bring a friend. 5.15 tomorrow, Pacific Daylight Time. I'll see you all there. Bring a friend. We're going to have 26 plus people on the live tomorrow. God bless.